Good evening. My name is Drew Johnston. I'm a member of the Great Decisions Committee as Vice Chairman, as well as a board member of the World Affairs Council of West Michigan. Welcome to our third program in a Great Decisions Global Decision Series. And here's a little pitch. If you're not a World Affairs member, welcome. You may join us for as little as $10 a year <clears throat> with our email membership. The membership desk is open after the program this evening. <clears throat> we know you'll want to stop with just this discussion tonight and by joining, the rest of these discussions will only be $5 each. We're also selling the Great Decisions book. If you haven't uh, received one of these or stopped by, there's a lot of additional information in here on each one of the topics, and it's only $20. Please join me in thanking our sponsors this evening, Aquinas College, Aquinas College, and Davenport University. Thank you very much. So now to our evening's panel. If you need a convincing that what happens elsewhere in the world also affects us here in the United States, you only need to look at the food insecurity and water shortages happening right now in Africa. While we were assembling this panel for tonight, we were delighted with the depth of the knowledge of our local experts on the panel this evening regarding these issues, and you will also be impressed. Dr. Steckety, who will act as our moderator this evening, served as the Executive Director of the Central for Sustainability at Aquinas College and continues to contribute to the Aquinas commitment towards sustainability and she has been on the Educational Partner Advisory Board of the World Affairs Council for several years. Dr. Steckety, thank you for being with us, and I will now turn the program to you to introduce the panelists. Thank you very much, <coughs> thank you very much and uh, welcome to all of you to Aquinas. We're very happy to have you here with us tonight, especially with the conditions that you've endured getting here. We will get right with it. I think that we have been featuring the bios of our panelists, and I just want to refresh uh, your attention. We have Dr. DeVivo here from uh, Grand Rapids Community College, who is the professor of geography there. And we have Dr. Gerald Nyambe, Nyambane, Nyambane. Nyambane <laughs> every time, uh, who is a professor of economics and associate department chair at Davenport University. Tonight we are going to spend the first uh, few minutes that we have together framing our topic, and both Gerald and Mike are going to do an expert job with that. Um, Mike will be dealing with the macro view of some of the new and emerging drivers in Africa and their implications for the U.S. Uh, Gerald will be looking at the ground level and, and telling us more about those drivers in that particular uh, part of the world. We'll then have a few follow-up questions. That's my turn to get things started. And then we'll have time, plenty of time, for your questions and, and answers regarding the topic that we have here or comments that you may want to share with us. Traditionally, the historical drivers of food insecurity and water shortages in Africa um, have really focused on solving these problems in two ways. And those two ways have been basically trying to get the policies right, so looking for better policies, or trying to approach the subject by a more efficient use of existing resources. The challenge was that these solutions were based on a world that assumed two things, good governance and also unlimited resources, assumptions that we have really seen um, undermined by world events and ecological realities. So what we are asking our two panelists to first do for us is to take a look at this time during the Anthropocene where humans are really reshaping our world and give us some ideas about the new or emerging drivers that we're seeing in Africa and their implications for the United States. So Mike, we're gonna begin with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Is that all right? Okay. 
addressing a vital American interest, climate change in sub-Saharan Africa. What you see here is an illustration that marks the uh, changing global temperature over the course of the last 500 years. And it's very apparent that one sees an exponential increase in global temperature that's concomitant with the uh, period of industrialization and its aftermath. If there was ever a smoking gun that was needed to indicate that humans at, at least facilitated uh, an increase in global temperatures, it was the research that was conducted about a dozen or so years ago that was drawn from assessing boreholes scattered throughout the world. This is a bit of research that is very significant in global climate change research. And even though you might have heard about global climate change last week and you're angry about it, you don't want to hear about it anymore, or maybe you're just tired of listening to somebody talk about global climate change. <laughs> Should I take this off? I think so. There we go. We'll do this. <laughs> How's that? Is that OK? OK. Where were, oh, so you might be tired of listening to people talk about global climate change and wondering, my goodness, it's snowing out there right now. I'll ask you, please, pay attention. And I'm sure you'll be able to understand not only the intricate nature of this phenomenon to some degree, but also how what happens in Africa vis-a-vis -vis global climate change does have a marked influence on the US. Yes, global climate change can result in a number of environmental changes itself. Sea level rising, for example, as you might see here at the tip of South Africa, or maybe even an expansion of deserts, a process known as desertification. Here we see in Namibia, for example. But what's, what's more important in some ways is how it, how it influences humans, and here it relates to water availability. What we note is that there is a significant change of water availability in association with increased global warming, particularly throughout much of sub-Saharan Africa. We see it elsewhere in the world, but we're talking about sub-Saharan Africa at the moment. And this is uh, particularly important for a number of reasons that we'll discuss in a few moments. We see that many people in, in sub-Saharan Africa rely on water coming from runoff. And so if we see a four degrees Celsius uh, um, uh, increase in temperature, which is about seven degrees Fahrenheit, we can anticipate that red area, a very significant decrease in runoff. The red areas are, are highly significant, Southwest Africa, uh, Western Africa, and then of course in Northern Africa. We're concerned with Sub-Saharan Africa at the moment. Why runoff? Because this is how many people who are associated with climate intensive economic activities such as agriculture get much of their water, is through runoff. And we do see an increase in the proportion of time in drought throughout much of that region as well. Yes, there will be people that will be dreaming of having plentiful water. But lo and behold, in much of sub-Saharan Africa, such as here in Limpopo and South Africa, women and children are responsible for drawing water from whatever sources they can get those supplies. They don't have running water in their homes. They might live in an environment that is dusty and drab and characterized by really no running water, no wells really. They might get their water from springs. And so day in and day out, they'll go ahead and gather that water. Here, this young boy in Namibia, who's running with only one shoe because that's all he has, is in a marked desert environment, and he is about 90 minutes away from, a 90 minute walk away from the closest water supply, which is on the Angolan border. And here in this area, the men have gone away, leaving only 
there are women. This young mother remains here with her children, uh, hungry, hungry, uh, very hungry, as the children are hungry and, and, and tasked with eating porridge. The men are away herding their livestock because of drought that has occurred for the last several months. Here, incidentally, the Chinese have offered a, a very small monetary sum to the Namibian government to facilitate uh, in addressing, addressing some of the drought problems. Uh, likely none of that, or perhaps just a small amount, will we'll get to the people that are, that are hurting. And here, a couple of girls and a young boy are eating porridge out of a bucket, which they might be consuming um, once every couple days or so. Notice the distended stomach. This young lass here is uh, not married, and she, who lives in the same rural region of northern Namibia, this Himba uh, girl, is going to move to a large town, the largest urban area. We see that this global climate change has sparked the necessity for people to move because there's, there's no way that they can grow crops and have the water to sustain their livestock. And so she will move to an urban area and engage in probably begging or selling trinkets or something of that nature to sustain herself. And what we see in urban areas, quite frankly, are a number of people moving from rural environments. This is the largest, largest, uh, most significant type of migration occurring in much of the world today, this rural to urban migration, where we see a number of uh, people in Africa actually engaging in uh, sack gardening. We see it in Kenya. We see it in parts of sub-Saharan Africa now, where people are gardening in their slums because they can't afford the food prices that have risen as a consequence of the uh, marked increase in, um, in temperature that's correlated with, with either status quo or lower levels of production. However, some places, some places in sub-Saharan Africa will experience uh, relative stability in terms of precipitation and moisture supply. Here we see in southern Kenya, a uh, young Maasai woman with her child. Her uh, man is uh, herding livestock, and the livestock are tolerating the temperatures in the environment were very well. There might be some concern about overgrazing, but by and large, the um, situation is not bad, except for one thing that we have to be concerned about, and that is a threat of uh, disease, epidemic disease, or even disease that is especially going to have vectors in the forms of various flies and insects that will transmit certain ailments to children, especially fragile members of the population, as a consequence of increased temperatures. So those are things that we have to be concerned about, too. Why should we be concerned about some of these things? Let's look at some of these data very briefly. Very briefly. If you look on the left, you'll see some countries identified with bold lettering and some are not. Those countries that are uh, struck as bold are those countries that have experienced decreases in life expectancy. And so we see some marked decreases in life expectancy. Look at Botswana, for example. From 1980 to 2010, it went from 61 to 46 years of age, uh, largely attributed to HIV AIDS. But still, if life expectancy declines, if we go over to the right side, the second to the right column has a percentage of population under the age of 15. Look at those numbers. Large proportions of the population under the age of 15, slightly under half, for some, slightly around, uh, right around a third for others. And so we see that here in sub-Saharan Africa, a large number of the countries have very uh, young populations, which means they are dependent upon the remainder of the population. A couple of other things. Let's look at IMR, infant mortality rate, number of infant deaths per thousand live births, okay? Basically, if you have a, uh, Angola has an infant mortality rate of 98, which means that 9.8, almost 
10% of the children die before they reach one year of age. Whereas in comparison with the US, you see that our infant mortality rate is right under six. These are indicators that suggest to us that this is a young country that is suffering in many ways as it is struggling to engage in development. All the way to the right, we don't have literacy, we have female literacy. And the female literacy rate indicates that there are some countries that are much better off than others. Let's look at Zambia, for example, 51.8% of the females are literate. So if half of the females are not literate, or about half the females are not literate, one has then a problem in terms of facilitating higher levels of development. These are just suggestions, or I should say suggested variables to indicate levels of development that we have to be concerned about. Why? Well, if there is, if there are low levels of development, we're likely to see civil unrest as we see here in South Africa. If we, if we look at some civil unrest and rioting that is taking place, it's not just come as a consequence of low wages, it's come as a consequence actually of food price increases in many ways that the low wages could not meet. And so people are actually hungry. And these disparities in wealth between the haves and the have-nots became pervasive. Where there is the civil unrest, we see that there is a greater likelihood then for poaching to occur of the black rhino. That is numbering few, uh, $20,000 US per kilo of its horn sold to China and Vietnam. And poachers have helicopters and they have uh, fast vehicles and there are anti-poaching patrols that will shoot poachers on sight. We find that there are some mechanisms in place to combat the poaching, but when people live on the edge, when they're living close to despair, poaching is a likely outcome in many ways. We also see in some places the ins uh, military installations. Here is a uh, uh, Namibian military installation set up as a consequence of perceived possible unrest in northern Namibia by some of the indigenous people who were not fond of the idea of the Chinese interests gaining momentum in this area. And so Namibian military installations have been set up. And we see, incidentally, as a result of the Chinese influences, that there is a lot of Chinese money going into mining, tracks laid down by vehicles associated with uranium mining, as we see that much of sub-Saharan Africa is associated with the production of precious metals. Nearly half of the world's diamonds come from sub-Saharan Africa. Diamonds not just for jewels, but for industrial cutting that's associated with mining elsewhere in the world. We also see that 16% of the world's uranium is coming from this region. And then, of course, South Africa has a number of metals associated with hardening steel, such as vanadium and rhodium. Democratic Republic of Congo, cobalt, 36%. Now, the plot thickens. Let's look at population projections. All right, in 2013, Sub-Saharan Africa made up 13% of the world's population. We, see, we expect the jump to about 15.5% of the world's population in 2025, and bada bing, bada boom. In 2050, more than one out of five people in the world will be living in sub-Saharan Africa. That's about the same number as reside in China today. So it's little wonder that the United States government is making plans to establish a presence in much of Africa. And here we see the US military presence is pretty pervasive. I should point out that there is only one permanent military installation established in Djibouti. However, these dots and these uh, different colored uh, icons, if you will, indicate the presence of uh, airfields that the United States government may have landing rights to, have secured landing rights to, or they may have um, forward operating sites or forward operating bases, and they might be engaging in the training of indigenous forces. Still, the, it will be an increase in 
US troop presence in Sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, just on, when was February 16th? Was that yesterday? <laughs> okay, in the Los Angeles Times, the United States should seize the opportunity to contribute to a greater international effort to help turn Africa gradually from a zone of conflict to a zone of hope. Doing so will be good for America's own security and economic interests, as well as humanitarian ones. Regardless of what side of the fence you choose to live on, the United States is creating a presence in Africa. You might not like it, but it's happening. So, Africa, climate change, food security, intertwined issues. Thank you. So Mike has shared with us a few of these, these trends that we're seeing. We're seeing the environmental consequences of climate change. We're seeing societies in despair and the political conflict that results from that. And then we see population and migration changes. So now we can turn to Gerald who can share with us some other observations that are closer to the ground and can uh, impress us with the kind of realities that will have some implications for the United States. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Mike, for that wonderful presentation, and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, <coughs> I am going to share with you some ideas that I have about food security. On the slide that I'm showing, I'm showing three pillars of food security. In other words, how do we determine that we have food security in a country? The food must be available. And once it's available, then the other pillar is it must be accessible. People should be able to afford, they should be able to, to actually acquire that food once it's available in the country. The first one is a supply side issue. We are thinking about domestic production combined with imports of food, while the second one is a, a demand side issue. Can the people afford that food? The final pillar is one of utilization, where now our concern moves to, now that the food is available and accessible to us, how are we utilizing it? Do we have a balanced diet? Are we eating healthy? I'm going to concentrate on the first two pillars, availability and access, in my presentation this evening. Okay. What I'm showing you on the, on the slide there are <coughs> three drivers of food insecurity. Okay. These drivers are what reduce our access to food or the availability of that food. The first driver which was uh, talked about or, or alluded to by Mike is poverty. That majority of the people in Africa are indeed poor. Okay. Then that coupled with the second driver of high prices, which he also talked about, that if you have poor people facing high food prices and then with high unemployment rates, they're not going to be able to afford that food, so they're going to be food insecure. And the final driver that I will take a look at is one of market access, that even when farmers get to produce whatever produce they, pr they have, they sometimes have a limit to how or where they can sell their produce and even what type of technology do they utilize. So I'll share with you some statistics that I got from the World Bank website and CIA data book. The graph I am showing you on, 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 on the slide there shows the levels of poverty in Africa and other regions. So we are focusing on sub-Saharan Africa. In particular, there are two measures on that graph there. Those, the ratio of population living below the poverty line as indicated by $1.25 a day, that's purchasing power parity price. And for sub-Saharan Africa, that percentage is 48% that 48%, literally half the population, live on less than $1.25 a day. If we raise that poverty line to $4 a day, then that percentage goes to 90%. So we are really saying in Sub-Saharan Africa, 90% of the population are living on $4 per day or less. Overall, if we compare to other regions, at least there are 30% more of its population in Sub-Saharan Africa that is living in poverty than 
the closest region that is also poor, that is the East Asia and Pacific, the first, the first set of columns. Okay. So the conclusion for us here is that indeed Africa has a lot of poor people. Then I show you a graph of prices. But before I do that, let me, let me re <coughs> revisit poverty just quickly. When you look at statistics from agencies that are concerned with poverty in Africa, they are showing that we are making progress. So the graph I'm showing you is a trend line over time since the 1981 to 2010 of ratio of population that is, is still in poverty. If we take two points, like 1993, we had about 60% in poverty, but over about 20 years, by 2010, we had dropped to about 50%, so losing three, making progress on 10%. So that sounds good. So we should continue doing what we are doing until we take a look at the data closely whereby we are now looking at actual numbers. While that was the ratio, actual numbers of people entering poverty is going up. Between 1990 and 2010, it went up by almost 100 million people. The reason there's a difference is because while poverty is going up, population is also increasing. So population is increasing faster than poverty is increasing. So you really have a ratio of the numerator rising, the denominator rising faster than the numerator. So we still have people in, in poverty. Here, I will not stay on this slide because Mike had already talked about high food prices, and this is just the evidence that in sub Saharan Africa, indeed, that we have rising food prices relative to the prices of other commodities in, in those countries. So I cannot uh, let Mike just show pictures of Africa without me doing the same, so I will do that. But I'll do that for a purpose. Okay. The first picture you see there is a farmer who has harvested a bamba harvest of potatoes okay, and would like to sell them in a market center or in some urban center where he can get a good return for his investment. But he has to get somebody who uses the road that is on the next photo. Okay? That van there was being used by the Kenya Study Abroad program participants, so these pictures were actually taken by us in 2010. Okay? And later on in that photo, we get stuck, and then we had to push that van out. So that told us, those the previous graph showed us that m accessing markets, even when you have a produce, during the rainy season is going to be difficult. Okay. And the crop you have produced, if it's perishable, then you are stuck. Now, the, the next two pictures that I am showing you here, I want you to note that these pictures were taken in 2010. So this is technology that was being used in 2010. On the first picture, that farmer is using animal traction to transport milk to the marketplace. Okay. And in the next picture, that farmer has just finished weeding his farm. Now, if we think about this, that you have a big number of people in poverty in Africa, then you have even those who produce something still have hindrances getting to the marketplace, and we are still have a lot of people using technology that was used in the 60s or earlier. This compounds the problems that we want to talk about today. Thank you for your time listening to me. Thank you, Gerald and, and Mike, for your excellent framing of our topic tonight. So, Gerald, you were talking about poverty, unemployment, and rising food prices, and then also poor access to markets and agricultural inputs. And putting these things together in the face of, of global climate change, we have some really big challenges that we face. Now, some might say that can't food aid help us 
out of this problem? Is that where we need to go? To what extent does food aid contribute to the short-term and the long-term solution for food insecurity? I'm going to toss this first to Gerald. Thank you. Food aid, is a, the, the benefits of food aid is undeniable in the short term. And, and, and the U.S. continues to be a leader in stepping in and providing food aid, especially when we have conflicts. And we have a good share of conflicts in Africa. Even as we speak, we have few conflicts still going on in southern Sudan, mm -hmm. in Somalia, where the U.S. needs to provide this food. Okay. So that's a, a short-term benefit, that the people in conflict areas need immediate access to food. Over the long term, though, food aid can lead to difficult situations that while the intention of providing food aid is good, it doesn't necessarily go to the targeted community alone. It finds its way le leaking to the, those who are non-poor and who are not the target groups, who then end up selling this food aid in the local markets and literally acquired it for free because it's food aid, and now they're selling, they're, they're able to sell it cheaply, therefore undercutting prices of domestic producers. So over the long term, it, it will serve as a disincentive to the local producers. Okay. So a, a different take on what we've considered to be helpful, right? Yes. Okay, Mike, I've got a question for you. So do these new drivers require changes in what we have defined as our self-interest and in our conventional notions of citizenship? Very, very solid question, yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. Would you like me to go on? <laughs> okay. Uh, do these new drivers uh, facilitate new notions of citizenship? And I think that one thing is apparent, it's time for Americans, it's past time for Americans to consider themselves to be solely U.S. citizens, but to move on to consider themselves to be global citizens. That does not mean that we are not U.S. citizens by any means. In fact, I would argue that embracing, embracing global citizenship is in the best interests of Americans. How? Well, you saw the map of military installations. Do we want to be involved in military conflicts in areas that are characterized by low levels of literacy, low levels of development, and also high likelihood of terrorism and things of that nature? The answer, the answer is no, we don't want to. So how can we best ameliorate those problems? First, let's face it, we can't conquer Rome in a day. We can't say at the end of this presidential administration or the next one that we're going to resolve all of these issues. So we must adopt a long-term approach, certainly adopt a long-term approach and address social needs, address the economic needs of places, and also address problems associated with the environment. How can we do that? There, there are a number of issues that we must confront. It's very complex, very difficult. One of the things that um, my students, some of them who have uh, transferred here to Aquinas have continued to do that, and they have taken on the burden of contributing funds for the education of girls in Africa. I think... Um, our International Geographical Honor Society chapter has raised uh, funds to support close to the education of 20 girls for CAMFED, Campaign for Female Education. Why is female education important? Because girls tend to um, take education much more seriously than boys, especially in less developed countries. And we find that it also shows that there's a marked decrease in the... Um, diffusion of HIV AIDS, as well as decrease in natural increase rate. We also see uh, lower levels of fertility, or I should say lower total fertility rates. And we also see 
higher levels of economic development when females are empowered. So that's, that's just one strategy that we can consider as we attempt to do this through non-governmental organizations or grassroots organizations. I think I, I, I went a while. No, no. Here, please. Just one minute. Could I uh, take a, just a, excuse me a minute. Anybody that would like to ask a verbal question, please come down to one of the two mics. And if you're uh, so inclined, we can also have you uh, email your, uh, or text, text your uh, question to 616-828-6261. Thank you. Sorry Thank to interrupt. You. Yeah, so we'll hope to have some questions coming, coming down, and I'd like to get that started for us right now. Thank you. There is a carrying capacity within the region for population. The region can only sustain a certain population based on the resources, based on food, based on water. Do you see that carrying or that population rising well above the carrying capacity with the numbers that you had given compared to what the region can produce? And what do you see as a balance there and how does that balance reached? Me. That, that, that's a good question. Is, is the carrying capacity anticipated to be exceeded by the population numbers around 2050? And the quick answer is, I don't know. However, we also have to recognize that through the introduction of uh, GMO crops, whether we like them or not, they're happening, and green revolution technology, we do have the uh, opportunities to increase food supply in addition to taking in imports. This, unfortunately, however, is a region where the vast majority of the population today happens to be associated with climate sensitive economic activities, agriculture. And so, given where the, uh, this region is today, given the technologies that are available and the uh, high proportion of population that is not only living in poverty but in extreme poverty, the likelihood is, from what I can gather, no. However, we anticipate changes to occur over the next four decades that will uh, hopefully supplement those numbers and facilitate uh, higher levels of development. Did you want to add anything? I, I, I think that mine, mine works. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Sorry. I, w I let you answer that because you are the geographer and you're the one who believes in Malthus. <laughs> the, the presupposition, supposing that there's an actual limit of carrying capacity, I think is artificially placing limits on productivity. As I showed you on those slides, the type of technology that is even being used right now for production is f 50 years old. What if they just modernized? What if now they got a tractor and the, all that desert run they started irrigating so that the, f the current capacity, we can answer that question as being uh, whether it will be reached, but we can always challenge whether it's even logical to have that carrying capacity. So. Okay, quick follow-up. The carrying capacity with respect to water, I mean, you only have X amount of water in a semi-arid region. Once you've exceeded the water limits, your carrying capacity basically is, is terminated, is, not, is it not? It, it would appear to be so. However, there are regional, there's regional variability if you um, if, if you notice that in East Africa, there actually happened to be uh, anticip there, there were projections for increased water supply. It's just in, the, the, the biggest problem happened to be in uh, southwestern and southern Africa. And um, the groundwater reserves to date are largely unknown as well. So um, we just don't know enough to come to the conclusions, I believe, that that you're asking us to. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, my question resolve, or it revolves around the sovereignty of the nations, um, in particular of South Africa. Since we, you know, we, we know that historically the extraction of resources out of that region 
has played an economic role in the country. How do we facilitate, well, you already mentioned something about food aid and how that actually causes a bit more of a problem than a, a solution. How can we, um, as a country, um, aid these countries in their development without taking away their sovereignty, would be my question. Well, that's a tough question, that's a real one. Now, first of all, the mining or, uh, you, if you like, access to minerals is not a unique thing to just the US. All nations, including China, last year's presentation, we, we saw a case where everybody is scrambling to access the minerals. The best way to help a nation is if you have your own interest that is motivated by profit, and then it's mutually beneficial to the other nation as well, so that both of you are benefiting, so that the motive of engagement is that there's going to be a profit for you and a profit for the other country. That way, the sovereignty of that country is going to be preserved. Okay. The, the model of combating poverty and ensuring food security that the, the Deb mentioned that we have been using is one that assumed the policy environment was okay and we, tr we have all these resources. All we need to do is have the government come up with a policy that enables farmers to flourish. Maybe we need a paradigm shift. Maybe we need to rethink, should we even be engaging the government proper in terms of development or should we just find partnerships between in the, uh, different businesses, say an American business person in partnership with an African business enterprise. I don't know the actual path. Well, as a follow-up, then how do we get also governments to represent their people? Sometimes I, there's so much corruption, even in our own country, that you know, what can we do in that respect if there's anything that we can do? Already the U.S. is doing a lot, okay. and, 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 the effort, and, and the work of the U.S. in that respect needs to be acknowledged and applauded. Okay. Uh, quick examples. In 2007, end of 2007, beginning of 2008, the Kenyans had a, a disagreement about their political elections and wanted to go to war, and they did go a little bit of some violence. The U.S. was firm, President Bush stood firm and sent clear signals that that will not be acceptable, and that forced uh, the, the two parties to compromise. Okay. We saw in the case of Libya where the U.S. minimally participated, but it helped to prevent slaughters, and it continues to be engaged in Sudan and it continues to be engaged elsewhere. So the participation of the U.S. in that role is, 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 is wonderful, and we expect that it will continue to do, that, do so. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to comment uh, further, if you don't mind, and that is that uh, the uh, map of uh, the U.S. Pres military presence in Africa, it should be accentuated that the, the military uh, presence is largely associated with unmanned aerial vehicles and um, special operations forces. We don't anticipate having large divisional strengths as we have had in the uh, uh, Middle Eastern conflicts that we've recently engaged in or the Central Asian conflict, but it's a different type of asymmetrical warfare that the U.S. is hopefully going to manage in a sound manner. And um, also, I think that um, he hit the nail on the head when he was talking about perhaps we need a paradigm shift. Because what, it, what seems like is really effective in, in some areas I've uh, been to in parts of southern Africa relates to where there are, there are high levels of community empowerment and where communities are able to, smaller local communities are able to dictate their own destinies. And if these uh, smaller communities, uh, through grassroots efforts, which I, for lack of a better term, we will use grassroots efforts, are, are able to, to make a difference, and hopefully over a long period of time, um, that type of uh, development will become contagious. Oh no, do you agree? Yes, I agree. Oh, okay. Okay. Question from the audience. Um, what impact does food shortage in sub-Saharan Africa have in making those countries and or peoples 
more susceptible to influence from Islamic extremists from Northern Africa. The, the answer is it should be obvious that when you have people who don't have food, okay, when we're talking about people living on or below a dollar twenty-five a day, and food prices are rising, and I can throw out some unemployment numbers. If you ask, depending on where you look, Zimbabwe is ninety-five percent unemployed, eighty to ninety-five. Liberia is eighty-five percent. Kenya is forty percent. Namibia fifty-one. Even South Africa is twenty-five. So you are finding that here are people who are actually going to bed hungry. They didn't have anything to eat. So if an opportunity comes by good or bad, they're going to be vulnerable. They're going to be lured easily. And we have seen instances of those beginning to trickle uh, from Somalia. Even some of them have been a little bit in Kenya. Just because it's easy to find the unemployed who are hungry and idle and energetic and young, and it's exciting for them, and then they join. The extent to which this has happened and it's become a malaise, we don't know yet. But it's really a, a plausible route that they are taking. I, I don't really have anything to add. It, it, it appears also to uh, be somewhat of a threat in Tanzania. Um, particularly around Zanzibar were in, in eastern Tanzania. However, we just don't know um, how significant the problem could be. However, once again, with higher levels of education and higher levels of opportunity for development, the likelihood of uh, succumbing to, to uh, that sort of dogma is, uh, is much less. We have time for at least one more question, Dr. Steckety. Uh, would anybody else like to ask a question? Good. Um, after spending some time in Ghana last summer on a faculty-led study abroad, um, I found myself really startled, not only by the beauty of the country of Ghana, but um, by the amounts of trash and pollution that I noticed, not only in um, in the city, but outside the city, and I was wondering what impacts that has on environmentalism and sustainability long term. There's no infrastructure for trash management, and I wonder how that affects long term groundwater and accessibility to water as well. Well, I, I can't comment on Ghana because I've not been to Ghana, but I have seen that sort of. Um, what we might say is uh, r rapid uh, waste disposal anywhere in uh, places not only in sub-Saharan Africa but in Latin America and Southeast Asia. It certainly leaves a blemish on the landscape. Um, in, in it depends if there if there are uh, toxic wastes that are dumped, then of course those are problems, and that's another issue to address too. As as uh, parts of sub-Saharan Africa are, are designated as dumping grounds for developed countries, toxic waste, unfortunately. Um, but as far as those um, items that are discarded by individuals, it's, it's, it's interesting. There aren't rubbish bins, and yet there is a society oftentimes in transition where the wrapper in the snack was, the wrapper for the snack was a banana leaf, right? And now it's this, this type of cellophane that will take a long time to decompose. And, and that also requires a shift in uh, the mental model. And um, its impact, I, I can't tell you what its impact is, but it is unsightly. Yeah, uh, first of all, congratulations for going on study abroad program. I am certain that your life changed forever. That's what my students say when they come back. Now, 
what you saw is not unique to Ghana. If you go to Nairobi, you're going to find garbage dumps somewhere, you're going to find some smells. It's just the level of development, and also it is what role government plays or doesn't play. Okay. One, of, one of the ladies that came and asked the question here implied or, or said that governments are corrupt. That is true in some extent. Where we don't have a well-functioning system, then garbage collection is going to be difficult. But you also noted that it's not widespread in the country. It's more localized in the cities. So it's really something that can be fixed if we find a private government partnership that can fix that. It is something that can be fixed, and we hope it will be fixed. Okay. So, okay. You have one more, doctor. Go ahead if you've got a question. Well, I just would like to thank our panelists, Dr. Nayambani and Dr. DeVivo. It has been an incredible um, collection of insights that you bring, and I especially appreciate your groundedness having traveled throughout that region and seen firsthand that, that experience. So we, we appreciate that very much. And now to you. Stole all my words. So let's give him a big round of hand. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Good job. You're pretty good. Thank you. No, you are even better. All right. Um, that kind of ends the evening. But next week, I'd like you all to come and join us. We once again have Dr. DeVito here as our moderator, acting as the armchair with an armchair discussion similar to this with Dr. Yael Aronoff. Uh, and the topic is U.S. Israel relations in a changing Middle East. So our meeting's adjourned. Please remember to stop. If you're not a member, become a member. And thank you for coming this evening and drive safely. <laughs>